Yeah, it's great to be here. I have over that uh, time period, as Sanjeev just mentioned, worked in a lot of different areas. Uh, early, I was working in speech, more, uh, more specifically acoustic modeling and then speaker recognition. I worked in search and advertising for four years at Yahoo. Uh, you know, I started kind of going down further downstream, uh, working on dialogue systems and natural language processing. Uh, and now I'm actually starting to work on, which I'll talk about in a second, with a student uh, reasoning. Uh, that's one of the things that we're working on. So I sort of just over the years uh, tried a little bit of everything. Uh, right now, uh, I'm at Georgia Tech. I've been there about a year and a half. The Georgia Research Alliance is a nonprofit in Georgia that um, gathers together money from you know wealthy Georgia citizens to uh, try to recruit people to come in. And so I was lucky enough to get recruited on that. Um, I've been in industry for 30 years. So uh, making this jump to academia and be a professor was pretty unusual, but they uh, they helped out tremendously to, to make it possible for me to go there. So we moved from the Bay Area where we were there for 30 years, uh, back to Atlanta where I went to school uh, a long, long time ago in the 80s. So what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is one of the projects that is going on inside of my new lab. And um, before I get into the project, let me tell you a little bit about the lab itself. <clears throat> so it's, I call it the AI Virtual Assistant Lab or AVA Lab. I spent the last 13 years, 14 years working on personal assistants. Um, so I started working on that actually even before I went to Microsoft at Yahoo, I started working on that a little bit. Uh, but then when I went to Microsoft, that's when I really focused on that. And that led into the Cortana assistant all through that period of time at Microsoft in the early days of Cortana and then, uh, into Google, Google assistant. And then most recently at Samsung working on Bixby, <laughs> you know, I was, um, constrained by corporate ob objectives. Of course, you have to get certain products out in a certain time and, you know, uh, one of the early things that we were exploring at Cortana was, um, should we actually have an embodied avatar that you talk to, or should it just be voice? And of course, at, at that time, Clippy was still very uh, much uh, in the minds of people at Microsoft. No, no avatar. So it was very constrained. You know, as you know, Cortana ended up with a circle. <laughs> that was what you talked to, and voice only. So what I'm doing at now is I get the chance to go back and be free and try all these things. And so I've sort of embraced this notion that the uh, assistant should be, well, we don't know what it should be, but let's try all kinds of different, but let's actually try to make the assistant be a photorealistic, a full body digital human that you can actually interact with. Uh, the Ava can understand voice, of course, but also understand facial expressions and gestures and uh, but Ava can also emote intent in the same way. So, but the philo over overriding philosophy is that we're trying to build technologies that uh, don't automate for humans, but make humans more productive, more capable. And there was a uh, there was a book that Bill Gates put out in the late '90s called "Business at the Speed of Thought," and that was it was a great book. The idea was. You know, technology should be there so that when you're leading, as he was at the time, uh, a big company, if you have an idea, you ought to be able to just go from thought all the way through execution, and the technology should make it happen. And so sort of following along the theme of that, I'm thinking about that from the perspective of the assistant, that the assistant, given that it's augmenting you, as opposed to automating you, is um, supposed to be able to connect to your thoughts, what you're thinking, what you want to accomplish, and be able to uh, achieve that for you or with you, okay, without the Im impedance mismatch. So, and the other thing with the assistant is that it's not a, what we're thinking about, it's not a general purpose, one size fits all assistant. It's an assistant that helps you and improves you in different areas of interest that you have. And so the first one, since I, now I'm talking to uh, students, is what if you had an assistant that could help you actually conduct research? So we're working on this right now, which is 
um, I, I, I talked to my research assistants, my PhD students, and I said, we want to build a research assistant, a PhD student. <laughs> and that PhD student is not to replace you, but to help you. Like, for example, let's say that you had a, which everybody's doing all the time, right? You're reading all these papers from all these other uh, researchers, and you're, you're trying to connect the dots. What if you had an assistant that could read the papers with you? You have discussion about the, the, tech, the scientific papers and you know, or textbooks, or that sort of thing. Okay, so a research assistant at the speed of thought, or a teaching assistant, which for the professors in the room, uh, would be a very wonderful thing to be able to not have to answer the same question 57 times, but have an assistant that learns how to interact with the students. Uh, in, the, in the law area, having a legal research assistant that and now, and this gets definitely out of the realm of where the user is an expert. So this is where it's just a lawyer, that wants to use the technology. So it's a legal research assistant or in the medical field, doctor's assistant, even all the way over into creative arts. So like a, a music composer, uh, I actually have a project right now at Georgia Tech on this, which is, can we have build a composer's assistant that can help you to, um, like in my case, someone that's not uh, trained to compose music, but am a musician and I have a lot of ideas, can the assistant help me do that? So, you know, all even in creative writing, you know, all these different areas. So the premise that we're following is that the AI digital human needs to be a partner with the user. And the, the more equal we can make the roles, uh, the more efficient the knowledge is shared. And I think you probably would agree that up until very recently with ChatGPT, if you're thinking about Google Assistant, Alexa, or Bixby, you know, you're interacting, it, it's very much of an unequal kind of partnership, you know, you have this box on the, in your kitchen and you say, hey, Alexa, what's the temperature outside? But it, you're relegating these low level tasks to this box. The ability of that box to express itself is not nowhere near equal to, to you, right? So this notion of a digital human is, you know, and what I'm showing you the picture down there are, these are artificial photorealistic uh, avatars, which are actually really good these days. Um, and so the idea is that you could walk up to, you know, in the far right, you can see walk up to a big monitor and just, and that's what we're building right now in the downstairs lab at Georgia Tech is Ava. Just, Ava stands there waiting, walk in. Hey, Ava, how are you doing this morning? You know, uh, so we're exploring that. Okay, so this is my lab and my PhD students. Um, I'm just getting started on most of, of these projects. So these are early on. In fact, what I'm going to talk about at the end here is work that uh, Ani is doing, and we just put it in the archives a week ago. So it's, you know, uh, and this he's working on multimodal conversational inference and generation. Uh, Benjamin is working on open knowledge, Im image grounded conversations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, common sense reasoning that Chris is working on. Uh, I have a student that's working on UI research. So she's looking at the overall uh, engagement with the, with the users. Um, I have a student that's just starting right now in conversational textbooks. So give it a textbook and just have a conversation with it. Um, and then I have two master's students that are exploring uh, uh, conversational GUI, which I'll talk about here a bit more, and then talking with robots. Okay, so that's the lab. Um, let me let me actually go through the outline of the act of the technical talk here. So I'm going to talk about visually situated conversational interactions. And I'm a, I've, I've been working on this a long time. I'm a big fan of and still a believer that context um, is still uh, yet to be fully tapped when you're talking about uh, personal assistance, speed systems, natural language systems, even with uh, the large language models that have come onto the scene in the last few years, let's say the last six or seven years, uh, they can benefit from context. So I'm going to show you about how. Uh, I'm going to Go back a bit in time, talk about some of the early work that we're doing in MSR on this topic. Then I'll switch into uh, different visual context that's shared between the end user and the computer, let's say on a screen, like forms, like fit form filling, um, vision, like smart glasses, uh, and then conversational tables is where I'll spend most of the time of the talk. Okay, so way back, way back when, <laughs> 2012, um, I gave the keynote at SLT 
And um, I had just come out of search. So I had spent four years in search and advertising. So I was really influenced by that experience. And I was thinking about how do we leverage all of that massive data in the search community over for the speech community? And so there was at that time in the search community, this you know, taxonomy of the web, tax, uh, of intents. Andre Broder, who I worked with at Yahoo, you know, had this famous paper. So I was trying to sort of extend that or bridge over to speech and conversational systems with that same notion of, okay, we have the, can we cover these intents that you have on the web um, and then, you know, use all that data. So I called it conversational intent instead of just search intent. And I added a little bit here, but, you know, navigate, browse, informational intent, transactional intent. Uh, but one of the things that was super important was to note that we, uh, in, in the speech area, uh, we definitely, especially at that time, because speech wasn't really working uh, nearly as well as it is now, we needed to leverage as much as possible the context. So by that, what I mean is, for example, if you knew that the person was talking about a single entity, like in this example, you know, you want to you book a table for two, so it's it's a very specific uh, task, and it's at a specific restaurant, and there's one entity that the person's talking about. Um, it, you you could kind of design the system and leverage a constraint for that, but if you expanded that out, where you say, well, I'm not necessarily going to talk about, or I don't think the person's talking about a single entity. Maybe they're talking about a collection of entities. You know, like um, um, compare or look across this map and find all the Chinese restaurants that have above, you know, four stars or something. So sort of a, sort of at the collection level um, or at the page level or at the app level or even at vision level, right? So you're sort of expanding out. And uh, we started detailing out this grid of, you know, all these different intersections. Like if you want to browse, you know, and you want to be at the page level, you're talking about recommending content. Each of these had a, um, an opportunity for leveraging a certain type of context, uh, context, but it also had implications in terms of how you would design the, the uh, interaction, the, the human computer interaction. And so we started exploring this. Okay, how do we, first of all, how do we know uh, what's the intent of the user with respect to the context we can leverage? Okay, so we spent a lot of years and papers on the conversational intent side, which was you know, mining the, uh, we call it the web of intents uh, for and bridging it over for, for conversational systems. I will talk about that here. Uh, a lot of papers on that. Um, we all, after that, or kind of in, in parallel with that, we were doing the context side. So I am going to talk about the context side. So the context side, these are, you know, this is pretty well known in terms of the types of context that you can leverage these days. Uh, Today, I'm going to really focus in on, you know, the visual and, and dialogue context. But of course, there's also, you know, something, you know, about the individual, where they're at, the time, the day, the season, all that, that, that contextual information. And it's this idea that if I knew something about what you're looking at, either through smart glasses or let's say we're sharing a screen, um, you know, can I leverage that? Or let's say that you're, you know, you're reading an article and, you know, it says, you know, and of course, the famed New York City Marathon in early November. You know, oh, I want to learn more about the marathon. Uh, this is 2012. So we're doing this. So you, you know, touch marathon and you say something like, "Tell me more about this." Yes, you know, simple things like that, or like I mentioned earlier, you know, circle an app and say, "Give me family family friendly ones." So one of the things that we recognized at that time was it's almost like it was almost like cheating if we could have this other modality. I mean, being able to just circle something or point to something uh, and then say something uh, was so much easier than being restricted to one modality where you have to say everything in words, right? And all the way back to, what is it, 1980, the uh, put this there paper, you know, uh, that was right. I mean, and a lot of the things that we were doing in, in the early days on this was because speech recognition didn't work, <laughs> natural language understanding didn't work, and we needed all the help we could get. Uh, and we could actually, with this kind of context, we could, you know, build some really interesting systems. So one of the early systems, um, in fact, this was going to be Cortana. This was how Cortana was going to launch originally. Uh, and then Siri launched on the mobile phone. And so we had to switch everything to mobile. But it was going to be Xbox. 
And the idea was that, you know, you're in your living room, uh, you have this on your, your screen, your Xbox, and, you know, you're playing games and stuff if you want, but you can also, you know, watch movies and, you know, and this is, again, this is 2012 in MSR. So let me just play a little bit of this so you can kind of get an idea. Um, this was really uh, limited speech recognition capability at the time, you know, you know 11 years ago. But um, what, we, what we're doing, the key to watch here is that no matter where you go, where the user wants to go, whenever you land on some page, the system is, um, has never seen the page before, but scrapes the page, grabs all the content and does easy things like update or adapts the language model. Uh, the intent uh, vocabulary is updated, you know, all that's on the spot. So every, it's very much a exercise of adaptation. I'm in the mood for Italian food. Okay, I'll look for Italian restaurants in Redmond. Show me the family friendly ones. Uh, between 20 and $30 a person. Yeah. Scroll down. So she's gesturing with connect. Show me the menu for this one. Okay, so at that time, um, trying to do that without the screen uh, was, was super hard. But with the screen, and this is, you know, basically she's just at that point just looking at links and she's just expressing what, what she wants to do, how she wants to navigate in natural language. But it's a super constrained problem, right? Uh, if you get people to actually gesture and point to something like what you did there and say, show me the menu for this one, uh, you're going to get it. Okay. So we did this uh, study where we had people, we told people, okay, we want you to gesture every single time you speak. So, you know, point to something and say something. And they were told, you know, you have to every single time. Even though we gave them the instruction, uh, they only were doing this like 25, 30% of the time because it was just so exhausting and unnatural. It's like, I, don't want to, I just want to, we, we interviewed people afterwards and I just want to sit on the couch and talk. I don't want to do this, right? Uh, but what we did is we separated the data and we said, when people did gesture, what kind of difference did it make? And if you can see this graph, so this is, um, this is Ms. probability and false alarm probability. So down in the bottom left-hand corner is where you want to be. Where we started was this black line, uh, which is way up there in terms of, this is just detecting intent. What is the person referring to, you know, on the page? Um, so this is up, up there without thrust here. When, when we actually had people, we took the 30% of the time when they actually moved after, we jumped way down to this blue and pink line. So it's like this 50% error rate reduction. And so it's a huge deal. But we had this problem that nobody wanted to gesture, or at least not gesture all the time. So I, clearly what we decided to do was, well, let's, let's look at eye gaze, right? You're always looking at what you're, what you're doing. And so we started working on this. This is with Malcolm Slaney and Bill Lichter and all of us in the early days of Cortana. And we started looking at, well, what, what, at the time it was the Toby uh, uh, eye gaze tracker. And um, it turned out that if, if you use that and spend a little bit of time with it, you didn't really have to say much. You could almost grunt and the system knew what you meant. It was so powerful because it was always on, always knew what you were looking at and then we were talking to it. And it, it was one of those things that was kind of a magical moment for the, for the team and our demos. It's like, oh my gosh, we solved speech recognition and natural language understanding. Uh, we were cheating because we knew what you were looking at, right? But it taught us a lot. And you know, one of the things that, uh, if, if you see right here, this is this is where you're using only lexical features and then only base features and then combine them together. You're getting a big lift. The interesting thing is that this means uh, perfect speech recognition, and this is at that time pretty errorful speech recognition. That even even though the speech recognition um, uh, drop drop down, uh, we're still maintaining this level of utility, and that kind of led us into 
um, address C detection. Andreas, uh, Stolke, Liz Schreiber, uh, they were motivated by, you know, how do you know when the, we, we had an open mic. So how does the system know when you're talking to it? And um, so we started thinking about, well, we use a camera. If you're looking at the at the screen, you must be talking to it. That's, a, that's actually not true. Uh, if you're not looking at the screen, you're probably not okay. talking to it. But if you're looking at the screen, you might be sharing the screen with, you know, someone next to you and you're planning to go to a restaurant and you're talking to each other about, well, what, I, we had Chinese last week, what about, and the, and the computer kept saying, uh, excuse me, you wanna go to Chinese? No, no, I don't wanna go to Chinese, you know. So it motivated this problem of, you know, you talking to me, <laughs> who are you talking to? Address the detection. And what we found at that time, it's probably less so true today, but when you would talk to a human, the prosodic features, the prosodic variations was very different than when you talk to a machine. When you talk to a machine, it was much more careful, much more rhythmic, you know, and then you talk to a person and it changes. Uh, and so we developed that. So anyway, that's some of the early work that was going on. A lot of that was happening in Microsoft research. Okay, so it's kind of skipping forward, right? And which is um, work that I was doing uh, at Google and Samsung and a little bit at Microsoft, but especially Google and Samsung. So this idea of, and this motivation that we had, I had from all these experiences of you know cheating and how big of an impact this made, uh, we started doubling down on this said, okay, before when we did the browser, we were kind of thinking about voice clicking and we were working on the natural language expression that we wanted, but you know what you're actually doing on the screen was pretty simple. What about the other elements on the screen that are more sophisticated than just a link? What about form filling? You know, what about there's a table uh, on the screen and you want to have some conversation over a table? Or what about if you have smart glasses? So all of this kind of led into a series of papers um, leveraging this content. And I'm just showing the stuff that's happened over the last, let's say, four or five years. At these different places. So the work up here is conversational vision. This is what I'm going to talk about here in a minute, conversational tables. Uh, the conversational forms was work that I was doing at Google, and then we've done some multimodal work. So this is the outline of the rest of the talk here. I'm going to talk about a little bit about, um, uh, about some of the, like the forms and visual, and then I'm going to go into tables. Uh, and these, these arrows that I'm pointing to here, this is what has just been in the last year since I've been at Georgia Tech, uh, the kinds of things that we're starting to do. So multimodal conversational AI survey, survey uh, a, a visual question answering uh, data set uh, using outside knowledge or open knowledge, and, and then this conversational tables. Okay, so I'll start with forms. So at, at when I when I just, uh, I've been at Google for a little bit, uh, but what we were trying to do, we were trying to help the Google Assistant team and uh, it didn't make sense to us that if you're talking to, uh, let's say, a form, like you see a form that's on the screen, let's say it's uh, Southwest Airlines, that you had to build or train and tag data for Southwest Airlines um, flight application when you already did this for American Airlines. It didn't make, I mean, it's like, the, the, the idea that it was that the designer is motivated to make uh, put design elements that are really simple that for a human, when you go to, you've never seen, you know, the Southwest Airlines app, but, but you know what to do. You know that a little arrow means play, you know, a little box means, oh, I can type in, in my search query, you know, all these kind of simplified elements, design elements in the way that they're designing so that it's, it's easy. So the idea was, well, why do we need to train up each of these separately? Why can't we just, you know, use information from, from before. So at the time, uh, 2017, you know, LSTMs and stacked LSTMs was sort of state of the art for spoken language understanding and slot filling and that sort of thing. But like I said, it didn't scale very well. It's like you had to do each one separately. Um, and so what we did, we just recognized a really simple idea, which is, well, I mean, if it's a form like Southwest Airlines, uh, if it says departure city, uh, well, we ought, to, we ought to be able to read departure city and know that that's probably something that they're going to say. Um, now, American Airlines may have said, you know, leaving from, but that's not a hard problem to kind of 
oh, well, semantically they're equivalent. We can actually use that information and pull it over. So all we did was we started, you know, grabbing uh, phrases that were on the form and then injecting that in, in this stack LSTM. And we were, we were uh, again, surprised by being again, uh, because we're leveraging context, but a uh, huge, huge difference. So what I'm showing in the left there, these are different domain, uh, different domains like book a room, book tickets, flights, and so on. Uh, the CT, that's our, what we call the concept taker that we did at, at Google, that's zero shot. Of course, the other uh, approaches at that time didn't work at all with zero data because they were all they were all supervised, trained with supervised data. And these are F1 scores. So we were already, I mean, internally, we knew we'd get to about 0.6 uh, F1 before you could talk about deploying something. So just zero shot, we were, we were pretty good. And then what the 5, 20, and 100 is, how many samples you would need. And what we wanted to see was, can we build on top of this, you know, zero shot? Does it, does it sort of saturate out? And it, it still kept doing better than the previous meth methods, um, which is, you know, uh, this uh, single task, multitask that was sort of supervised, you know, as you get to 100, it's still doing better. So anyway, that was sort of a, uh, another aha moment, like, wow, this is easy. We ought to be leveraging all this information. And um, so after, after I left Google, I was, at, I was recruited to Samsung. And this was, um, I started this project, it's a bunch of different projects actually, kind of following along this idea. And one of them I did with Simon Heck, who's my son. And this was uh, during the COVID period. And he was bored, he's an undergrad student at Pomona College, and uh, he didn't have an internship yet. And I said, well, why don't you do an internship with me? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, what? <laughs> well, room aboard. <laughs> Gave him his room. Uh, so he kind of reluctantly agreed. And I, I, I may have sort of, you know, tainted him now because I made him do all the data collection and labeling, <laughs> Crap, working with a uh, mechanical Turk. And, uh, but anyway, so we did this thing together. Uh, <laughs> And what the idea was kind of, you know, you could have a computer vision system instead of, you know, just scraping information like the destination off of a form. Uh, you can actually do computer vision on the screen or your app on a, in this case, a mobile phone. And you could identify, you know, different elements. Like I, like I mentioned, the, the triangle mean play. Well, that was easy for a computer vision system to do. And you could kind of lay it out. So you, we call it semantified user, uh, user interface about what uh, what's the semantic uh, function of all these different boxes on the screen, and then uh, based off of that, then we could build bit share data across all these different apps uh, that had the same semantic element, right? So you'd have to relearn all of that, and we started getting some really interesting results. And then the other thing that we did here that was really interesting was we said, now this was the early stages of the large language models. So BERT had come on the scene and variations like Albert and so on. Um, the question answering systems um, at that time um, were you know, getting pretty good, like using squad one or squad two, two or 2.1. And I wanted to figure out a way to leverage the question answering system here. So the idea was, well, if I, if I can identify, you know, these elements on the screen, I could think about those elements, each one of them is asking a question to the user. So, so think about each element on the screen, all of them asking questions at the same time. You know, in this case, it's a vehicle logger and it's trying to make sure you track your mileage and, you know, your, your description of the trip and the vehicle. So like the vehicle, this form that you fill out, the vehicle's uh, field is saying, which vehicle did you drive, right? So you could really easily construct uh, synthetic questions from the form. And then when the person actually, so obviously the person's not hearing this, right? They're just sort of, but when the person speaks, um, that's the paragraph. So think about a shirt like this. So we reformulated this so that the form is talking like this silently. The person is actually speaking, so they're they're saying the what is the paragraph? The form is doing a question, 
And then we just turned, we just used it to exactly the same thing, which is, oh, if you want to know the answer, that is actually the slot. The answer to the question is actually a slot. So we did a slot taker using question answering uh, and visual information. So that was the first time I think that's been done. And that made a huge difference. Uh, you know, we were seeing, again, this is, uh, this is ATIS and then visual slot data set. One of my son had to put together. Um, but when we're talking about zero shot, we're getting up into the point six, as I mentioned earlier. So anyway, so this is super interesting, right? So uh, after this, um, fast forward a little bit to a year and a half ago, I came to Georgia Tech, or actually, let me step before I went to Georgia Tech. So uh, in parallel with this, I was at Samsung and we were working on conversational vision, um, this idea of you know smart glasses, you're walking down the street, um, you ought to be able to leverage that context. So let me show you one example of that. So the person's, let's say at a Williams Sonoma, there's a display of all this pasta making equipment. They're trying to sell you this and you have smart glasses. And so you, you look at uh, different items on the table and the system is not only identifying what's on the table, but bringing up information. So you could say, uh, you know, how much is this pasta maker? What, how much is it at Best Buy? So you're getting at Williams Sonoma, that sort of thing. And so that worked. And we were building it so that it was automated. It would go out and just grab information for question answering. Uh, but what we're working on here was, what if the, which is going to happen, the computer vision system failed? It didn't know what you're looking at. So in this case, you say, the user says, you know, what's this? And the system says, I don't recognize it. Can you tell me what it is? And the user said, well, it's a slow cooker. Uh, and so based off of that information, then the idea was, because it's human in the loop, in dialogue, that the system says, okay, I'm going to do a image search on slow cookers. I'm going to go grab all these images. I'm going to pull them all down. And I'm, it, it's going to update its computer vision system so that not only it can now recognize who slow cooker going forward, but it can also grab all of the structured information that's about slow cookers, like prices and reviews. On so on the spot, you could add an element and then, you know. So that's what this, we did web image crawling. Uh, we figured out how to do this in an incremental learning kind of way and then extend. And so that you have this feedback loop that goes back to the system. So we did a live demo for Samsung um, CEO. And uh, he said, is this real? And if you've ever spent any time in industry, that's a that are fake. They like script it out. He said, no, it's real. He said, oh, okay, well, so he had this really elaborate bracelet. He goes, let's try it on this. You know, it was Pixty at the time. Hey, Pixty, what's this? And he says, I don't know what this is. He goes, well, that's a bracelet. And they said, okay, let me, I'm gonna go learn about bracelets. And my team was behind me like, oh my God, is this gonna work? Uh, it went and then it, it would ding when it was ready, ding. And of course, you know, puts it up and of course it recognized. And some random person, yeah, and his bracelet was radically different. Fail came over and put his bracelet up and it worked. And not only it worked, it looked up, it told him, told, told uh, the CEO, what's the brand, how much it costs and reviews on it. So he was like, oh my God, this is, but this is another example of leveraging context. It's a cheating uh, it, it, rather than thinking of sort of unit, single modality. And if you wanna see more details on it, it's called Reload, um, this system that we put out there. Okay. So we did a bunch of other things in vision. Let me talk about tables now. So that's something that's very uh, recent. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna play this little clip. Sorry about it saying Bixby. Because I did this, I, I did this like a vision motivating kind of uh, video, scripted it out and everything. So it'll sound a little commercial. Hey Bixby, help me find an anniversary gift for my parents. How about flowers? Nah, a traditional one. I'm not sure what a traditional gift is. Can you show me? Go on Wikipedia, search traditional wedding anniversary gift. I found wedding anniversary on Wikipedia. Okay, scroll down. Scroll down. There. Okay, I'll remember that. Since it's your parents' 30th anniversary, how about a gift of pearl earrings and mother of pearl cufflinks? Perfect. Here's a selection of earrings and cufflinks. Start. 
Bixby learns new capsules from everyday interactions with millions of users on every kind of device. From Family Hub to all of Samsung's products, Bixby brings the multi-device experience to life. So uh, one of the things that I was preaching to the team at the time is, you know, embrace failure. <laughs> because you're going to have every system that you deploy is going to have failure. You don't want to ever abandon the user. You don't want to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. And that's the end of the conversation. You want to engage the user. Can you teach me about that? Tell me more about that. And in this case, it was a simple, yeah, well, you know, do a little web search, get to this Wikipedia page. Here's the table. And once the table came up, uh, which as you can see here, it had, you know, the year, first year of the anniversary, second year, and then appropriate traditional gifts. And the system was able to read in the vision, was able to read the table and understand semantically, oh, okay, now I know what you mean by traditional wedding anniversary since it's your parents' 30th anniversary. Well, how about a gift of pearl cufflinks? You know. Uh, so at that time, I knew this was very doable because there had been a lot of work that's been done for years and years on web tables in the search community. And we could leverage that. And you know, anyway, um, I hope as I show you what I'm going to show you right now, that you're convinced that it actually does work. Okay, so if you're going to solve this kind of problem, then you're going to be looking at, um, and, and by the way, just to kind of uh, say my punchline, this kind of uh, question, although it may be covered these days with large language models, uh, better, much better than, than it was, and I'll show you results on that, uh, it's still not quite the, the accuracy that you need to be able to do some, some, some task like this. So, so we're gonna try to ride on top of this wave that just is occurring right now. And I'm gonna show you a lift on top of uh, GPT 3.5 by using the co context. So context is things like the page title, page introduction, you gotta be able to read the text, uh, section title, section introduction, and then the table itself and be able to read and understand the table. So this is sort of what you have available. Now, note that if you look at that table, there's a bunch of links. So you're not just reading the surface, the uh, anchor text. Um, you're, you're reading the table and then you're, the system is crawling through, clicking through, and then reading the destination pages. And maybe they have links, right? So you, you want to crawl a little bit so that you bring, so that people can ask questions that are not necessarily on the table, but uh, you'd have to click through to get it. Okay. So there's this data set that was recently released called the hybrid data, hybrid, uh, hybrid dialogue data set. This was um, by the same group. This is at UC Santa Barbara, William Wang. So it's the same group that released um, a uh, QA, a question answering data set. And this was to extend that QA data set to be uh, multi-turn dialogue. Okay, so going from single question answer to multi-turn. Okay, so to give you an idea, what they did was they took the original question answering data set, which would be something like, you know, what was the year of birth of the prime minister who had a Canadian state funeral in 1892 at Jarvis Street Baptist Church? And the answer was 1822. Right? And they recognized people don't talk like that. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you remember the Wired magazine article about Biv Labs. Uh, and they, they had this example of, you know, on the way to my brother's house, Find me a good wine that goes well with lasagna um, under $10 or something like that. And I remember reading that thinking, wow, that probably took them a long time to figure out an example like that, that had all these different things. And because people don't talk like people talk more like in this case, uh, hi there. You know, do you know how much state funerals do you know much about state funerals in Canada? And the system says, yes, indeed, that these are public events that commemorate former governors, blah, blah, blah. And then the second turn, the person says, I see, thank you. Do you have a list of state funerals in Canada? I do indeed. And it brings up a table. Okay. And the person turn after turn gets a little bit more specific, a little bit more narrow until finally at the end, a person says, could you please tell me the year of birth for this man? Now, in this case, this is, you're climbing down on the table, but this last question, you know, it has this table, it says Prime Minister Alexander, McKinsey, but to find the information about birth date, you have to actually click through. And this link paragraph that's that's right here, uh, that has the information. So you, the system has to be able to climb down and get the information, pull it back up. Right? So this uh, conversational transformation from question answering 
in my opinion, from my experience, is a lot more realistic. It's more how people want to interact. Uh, still, super hard problem. Like, and I'll, and I'll show you what the, their numbers were and our numbers. We still still a lot of room to do. This is completely open, right? So this is open domain. Uh, you can ask anything. The first task is you have to go retrieve the table or a page which has a table on it, and and then you, so it's completely open. Anyway, so so more details on this data set. There's a lot of different data sets for this kind of thing. Um, I won't go through the details here, but uh, hybrid dialogue is one of the few that actually combines table and text. Usually they're one or the other. Okay. And, you know, it's good size. There's uh, 4,300 uh, dialogues and, you know, it's a good size data set. I would definitely, if you want to work on this problem, I definitely recommend looking at this data set. So this data set has this characteristic that the very first prompt or return uh, the person's asking a question that requires retrieval. Okay, so it's a little uh, constrained in that way. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, think about this architecture. This is our architecture. We call it conversational tables. And in this case, the question is: the first question is, you know, do you have a list of sporting events in Taiwan? Now that's a that's a retrieval problem. So we we encode the question. Uh, we also have. Uh, 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 we've already done this ahead of time, large number of tables that we've actually processed and we've encoded them as well. So we have these vectors. We're using Robert, Roberta base for this. Um, and then we're doing basically, you know, a cosine similarity between the question and the tables um, as opposed to thinking about it as just a text problem. So this is, this is called uh, dense table retrieval. And the prior method that was used was, you know, just simple BM25 kind of bag of words kind of approach. So we're, we're trying to go to the next level. Okay, so that's the first step uh, that, that we're doing on this. The second step is once you get the table, then you wanna actually pull the cells information and where it links to all that information and have create cell embeddings. And so you keep uh, way in the far upper right hand cell encoder. So now you have this table that's retrieved, you have a cell, cell encoder, you maybe have a follow-on question, which is, you know, which event is also known as the ROC over? And so it's looking at the table with all this information and, and then trying to answer that question. And then what we're doing is, like I said earlier about riding on the wave, we're leveraging large language model for doing the, 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 the response generation at the very end. Okay. One thing that's really important about this is, and I'll give you more details, is that we can um, put a lot of information through the system uh, to the large language model. Um, we're, the way we're doing the training, it's it's a it's a uh, uh, we're, we're trying to you know maximize the similarity of tables where it's correct and push away you know the ones that are incorrect. That's on the DTR side, and like I said, we're we're using Roberta uh, with triplet loss for the cells cells embedding. Okay, so here's the wrap up. Uh, so. And there's a hybrid dialogue. They're using BM25. So if you've worked in search, you, you could say, you can know that that's, you know, probably beat that. Um, we, we went all out. I've got a PhD student that's really fired up. So, uh, you know, we more than doubled uh, the, the MRR, the mean reciprocal rank, uh, and top one accuracy. So, you know, we're using, that's, I just showed you this, you know, this embedding kind of approach. So the we we felt like there's that was a big area of improvement that could actually have downstream. Obviously, you get the wrong if you don't if you miss the table, uh, you, you're not going to be able to answer the question. So we did this first, got a huge improvement. Then we moved on to this component, and here this is we decided to break this problem into sort of a coarse state tracking, dialogue state tracking, and then with a fine state tracking. In the course, um, what we're doing is basically. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned, we're just trying to de determine what cell or collection of cells give us a ranked list of these cells that are most appropriate for that question. Right? So that's what this is. C tables is ours, conversational tables. Uh, we basically matched the state of the art, but the state of the art is top us. Um, they actually did pre-training on tables. So we didn't do anything like that. So we felt good that we could get there without even doing, doing this uh, uh, pre training on tables. Okay, and then uh, when you start thinking about ranking, you know, these cells, 
so what we're, what we're doing is saying what we looked at was uh, well, what would be the the performance of the system, the accuracy of the system, um, like we're comparing to uh, the previous methods with this top one, because it's a, you know the select one. Um, but what if we actually use top three or top ten? So we we bring back all these cells with all their associated. Uh, so if you if you know what would be the top three accuracy, top ten accuracy, and uh, I asked the student to do this, and you know this is a case where you say okay. Uh, it's obviously cheating because you know you're looking for the correct answer in the top three, but this is such a huge increase in such a small amount of uh, ranked elements that there's something there. We ought to be able to go after this. So we did, um, and that led into what what it turns out. And this is again kind of consistent with riding the wave with the large language models that are out right now. So we're using GPT 3.5. Um, you can actually present it with multiple, uh, like a ranked list of all these possibilities and in, in terms of the cells and then ask it the question. And it will, it has the breadth to be able to sift through all that information and do a remarkably good job of uh, giving you the correct answer out of the top three or the top 10, right? So in this case, what we're actually doing is we're, we're stuffing this information into the prompts. So you think about a, a prompt into GPT-3, go grab the content of the page, uh, uh, and the cells, go get the next best one, the next best one, and put it all into the prompt as context, and then add, ask the question. So what we're, what we're saying is that for the old state of the art, that's that top line here. Um, and, you know, uh, with Rouge 1 or 2 or L, uh, looking at these scores, you know, higher is better. So this is where we were starting with our baseline. And when we switched out from TR, we top one with GP 3.5. You know, we're getting significantly better, but almost double, more than double with 0.49. And then with the top three, where we're just not cheating anymore, we're just presenting all three with the problem. You know, we're getting way, way better, more than double the uh, best state of the art before. Uh, and there's another, this is, this is a uh, teasing down into the details here. Uh, this is if you had perfect table retrieval and you had perfect uh, answers all the way up until the last turn of the battle. I just wanted to see. Are we getting anything on top of, uh, uh, of what was there? Um, is it just all from GPT 3.5 or what is it? And so this is, I won't go through the details, but this is showing that no, we're actually getting a lift because of the context. That's yeah. So the, the tables, you know, how do you get hold of the column semantics? In the example, for example, that you have in front, it says which event is also known as the RSD open and the column heading is event. And is that coincidence? Does it happen? Sometimes that's one issue with tables. It's yeah. Not obvious what it's called. Yeah. We're so what was a little um, fortuitous for us is that we could train the system without without telling it this is column head heading or this is the row label, but training it, um, we we the system would learn and building embedding vectors, it would learn that oh the column heading has a certain function for all of the elements down at all the rows. So we didn't uh, teach it that. We didn't supervise it like that. We just, we trained it overall to the overall task and implicitly learned that, which gave it a lot of generalization power. Um, so we did human evals. This is our last experiments that we were doing. And in this case, we were looking at coherence, fluency, and then informativeness. So coherence is that, you know, the conversation through the turns is coherent, it's logical, right? Fluency is, you know, it doesn't have grammatical or spelling errors, and it's using the appropriate parts of speech. So this is, how many times did the human, this is an Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, with these qualifications, how many times did they prefer our system over the previous state of the art? So you know, significantly better than what we're achieving here. And then the informative of this is like the converse of hallucination. <laughs> it's what it is, it's, uh, where the uh, model response is semantically equivalent to the grounded truth response. So you, you know, it can make up something that sounds really compelling, but it be wrong. And uh, so this was the previous state of the art, and this is our system that we predict will happen. So some of these results are like a week old. So very, very new. Okay, so let me just summarize. So 
these are the different areas that I've worked on in the past. I'm working on right now is uh, conversational tables. Um, but I talked about forms before that kind of led into the work in conversational vision and tables. Um, and we've done some broader work now that I'm at Georgia Tech in terms of multimodal uh, interactions and you know uh, what are all the different things that we could explore. And uh, what we're starting on right now, and I'm actually starting this with my advisor, Jim McClellan, uh, is conversational textbooks and conversational papers, which I mentioned earlier. So thank you very much. I have a question about the table we prepared. So, uh, are you uh, are you creating this literature from scratch, or is it too strange? For example, in your training data, the 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 literature you take on some sport tables of time and place. So, then you're in touch on the season time so Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's trained. Uh, the language part of it is pre-trained, so it's Roberta base. We're, we're grabbing it out of Hugging Face, and we have this base which has the language parts to it. But then, when we're actually training, when we get into the hybrid uh, dialogue data set, then we are training on the, on the tables, right? So you're right in terms of if the data set is not balanced, you know, we we might be learning. Uh, only the tables that are in the data set, you know. So the, I think uh, the data set's really good, but I think now that we've seen that there's something here, I think we should expand the data set considerably for exactly that. Yes. Again. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you've been, uh, you've always been a visionary about thinking. You know, inspiring the um, inspiring the generation to build the next phase of the AI driven products. I'm wondering if you can share your perspectives on you know if you can share your current visions about you know where do you think AI is gonna look like in a couple of years or your choice of time horizon. Yeah, I think uh, one of the one of the things that's super important and it's definitely along the lines of this uh, context is. You know, these models are extremely large, uh, you know, GPT-4 and, you know, all the other models. And, and um, you know, how do you actually get these models to be smaller, more efficient, so that you can actually have conversational interactions with every device that you can possibly think of? And they have the, you know, quality of the approaches, what you think about when you're playing with chat GPT. Um, so then the question is, all right, well, how, what, what, what is the model, these large models representing that we can live without? And is there a different architecture that we can think about that is not just the one single big monolithic kind of model that's gonna help us get there? And certainly what I'm showing here, I, I hope you see that this is motivating this idea that you no, know, we should probably be using like a modular approach where if you have information, visual information or any form of context, uh, you, you could apply that um, and you're gonna get better performance. Uh, but because of that, you may not need, uh, you know, this massive model up front, right? There is an aspect of the models that we wanna keep, which is the open natural language uh, understanding. So then the question becomes, and I think this is what's gonna happen in the next few years is, how do you take you know something that's 175 billion parameters and start distilling it down when you know that you have you're augmenting the, that language model with downstream uh, specific applications that are leveraging context, for example, uh, where it still is able to have an intelligent conversation in open domain about whatever that downstream is. Let's say the downstream is you know something like a legal assistant or you know the system. Um, you distill it down, or let's say a better example is mathematics, right? We don't want, as you can see, uh, to rely on ChatGPT to answer mathematical questions because it's just not built for that. It doesn't have a precision. It's looking at, have I seen 373 times you know, 57 before? Oh, here it is, right? We don't want that. We want, so how do you distill that out? Because that's 
you're using parameters for that, for that hallucination of bad answers. How do you distill that out? So, and uh, be able to have general conversation where the system, where the model knows, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to call Mathematica. So I, I think what's going to happen is we're going to see this uh, architecture, like aug augmented uh, language models or neural symbolic uh, approaches. And uh, then we're going to start to be able to you know, implement this. That's one of the directions I think is going to be super interesting. The other, of course, is if downstream you're going to leverage you know, all the specialized context, you, you're going to need multimodal uh, sensors. And you're going to need to, the uh, chat GPT or the large language models need to be able to see uh, they need to be able to emote express emote gestures and expression and you know all of that. Yes. <laughs> Good question. You know, for a long time, uh, I would. This was early days of Cortana. Uh, we for a long time there we were getting overconfident. We're like, well, we can solve all these problems. Uh, and then I, uh, I was telling Sam to you this uh, last night. Then, then what we decided just open up the microphone and have everybody have to use it every single day. So we opened the mic. It was in a room. Cortana was in a room, or it was called Louise at the time, and you know failed miserably. Plus, people didn't really want to go in there all the time, right? So it was sort of like, and we had this kind of uh, come uh, this moment where we all got together and said, if we're if we're not going to use this every day and we don't find it useful. Uh, you know, people, probably other people won't either. And we started getting more and more convinced. This is counter, by the way, to the culture at the time, especially at Microsoft, which was, no, no, you're not supposed to build something that you'll like because you're not representative. You're supposed to do the studies and you get the, like, no. It, I mean, yes, we need to do that. But, but if we don't like it and we don't use it every day, and then because, uh, you know, you're in industry and, you have to respond to Siri on a mobile phone. You go, go down this path. So to answer your question more directly, you know, I, I use Assistant and I've been using Assistant every day, but it's relegated to things like what's the weather going to be like? What's the temperature? Play me something. Really simplistic things. So I think, I still think we're in the early, early days of these systems actually being useful. <laughs> So you can describe you know, iPads in some cases as effectively cheating. Yeah. Um, and I think for a lot of the examples that you showed, like there are kind of ways that a user could accomplish this task, you know, without using the context, just by providing more information, um, which maybe decreases the load on the yeah. user. Are there cases though where you just can't do the task if you don't have access to, like where the context basically is cheating. Yeah. You just can't, like the task sort of by definition won't work if you yeah. don't have access to the context. And what do you think of some of those? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question. I think we, we asked that question, but then we, we kind of backed off and said, even if you could accomplish this without the context, can you, can you be more accurate with the context? Can you be more efficient? With, you know, so we sort of softened it. And that actually was, um, that opened us up a lot to do this because there are examples that, and you can, you can, uh, and there are a bunch of examples actually in the uh, dial this dialogue, hybrid dialogue data set where, you know, co-reference and that kind of thing, where if you're just given that question you know, out of the blue, it wouldn't have a, a ability to sort of latch on. Um, you're just completely re relying on the dialogue context or, you know, tell me more about this. Or, or, what are you referring to? But I think those are sort of, um, they're, they're interesting, but they're not as, that's not the motivation. I think the motivation is more about, we want to, be, we're accurate like this, we want to be here. We, we're efficient like this, we want to be here. Thank you. 